When NVIDIA or AMD or any company launch a product, there's always a big debate of how long that product is relevant for and how long we should see new driver updates for that product. Now, understand, I'm not referring to drivers being available. In my opinion, if you have a graphics card, for example, which is circa 2005, as long as that company is still in business, I believe that they should still provide drivers for that product because you never know the circumstances you might need them. But how long does it make sense to update drivers for a product once it's been released? Well, <laughs> yeah, we're going to be taking a look at one of these. This is, I just realized I'm holding it upside down. This is a GTX 780 Ti. It was released late 2013, just before Christmas. And so it's a fairly old card. But NVIDIA have recently announced that they will be pulling driver support for GTX 780s, and in fact, all of the Kepler lines in the not too distant future. So I figured this video would be very interesting to kind of look at two things. The first is how well does this card actually perform now and kind of mid 2021? And the second is to actually discuss, does it make sense for NVIDIA AMD to continue to offer uh, updated drivers for a product such as this. Before we delve deeper into the discussion of drivers, let's take a quick peek at the specs of the GeForce GTX 780 Ti, a king which reigned supreme on Nvidia's gaming throne until Maxwell products kicked it off. The obvious and biggest drawback of the card, just initial glance, is the fairly small frame buffer, just 3 gigabytes. It used GDDR5 memory and Nvidia needed to feed the cores with tons of bandwidth, so opted for a wide 384-bit bus. Speaking of the core, it's a GK110B and sports 2880 CUDA cores, which is actually more than the GTX 1080 we recently looked at. However, it also sports 240 TMUs and 48 ROPs. Unfortunately, well, first of all, the architecture isn't as efficient as the GTX 1080s, uh, Pascal architecture, but also its 28nm process allows it to just reach 875 base and 928 boost. I'm using a shiny EVGA model here, which has actually more ambitious clocks, and I also soft modded this card back in the day, allowing you to throw a nuclear power reactor's worth of juice through it thanks to raised PLs. But the benchmark will be running here. Well, yeah, I just ran the card essentially at stock. You'll also notice that while this card does technically state it's DirectX 12 compatible, its feature level is only 11.1. .1. And this leads to some very interesting situations, which basically means certain games, for example, Death Stranding, Assassin's Creed, Valhalla, amongst others, well, they don't so much do the working thing. They basically just crash out and say that, well, sorry, Bob, you don't have a fully um, compatible DirectX 12 card. And unfortunately, this is one of the big problems, of course, with older architectures. As games continue to progress, well, they need new features. And there is a lot of discussion of whether you should offer, you know, fallback code paths and other things, which we'll talk more about, you know, later on in the video. But for now, basically, some games, which I would normally run in the suite, just simply refuse. They're like, nope not happening. Also with this card, I'm running predominantly at 1080p and 1440p for the tests. This is not really going to be capable of 4K gaming in the modern age. And also thanks to the smaller frame buffer, I've basically chosen to run this card with a couple of different settings. So the first is with settings which would be more comparable to the 3080 Ti, which we're going to be comparing against, just to, you know, give you an idea of, like, I don't know, Ti versus Ti, modern Ti versus older Ti, I suppose, but also lower settings which reduce texture quality and other things, which would be more in line with what you would realistically be running this card with if you were daily driving it. It also goes without saying that features such as variable rate shading, uh, mesh shaders and ray tracing are just not available on this GPU. Now, yes, of course, these are going to be really nice benefits when you move over to, let's say, an RTX 3080 or a 6800 XT or whatever your chosen GPU is. But, of course, the biggest difference is you're just going to get so much more performance. But 
yeah, let's talk about the benchmark methodology. So we're going to be running on a 10900K hitting 5.1 gigahertz and also plonking that with 32 gigabytes of DDR4 memory and basically all games are patched to the latest version and naturally we are also running all of the games on SSDs as well. Also a small note, a couple of titles um, like Horizon Zero Dawn are slightly CPU bound on the 3080 Ti. It just is what it is at 1080p, but nevertheless, let's look at the results. So the results are in and the GTX 780 Ti makes a fairly compelling case for itself when you consider just how old it is at 1080p, particularly once again, if you are willing to crank down the settings. And it's not really surprising when you think about it, despite the fact that um, you know, the card doesn't benefit from the OS and API optimizations of let's say an Xbox One or a PlayStation 4, the GPU is more powerful than a PS4. So, yeah, I mean, it can kind of do some brute forcing there. But at the end of the day, obviously, this card is definitely starting to show its age. And it's hard to ignore the fact that some games, again, like Death Stranding or Assassin's Creed, simply will not work. And this is the thing as well, because some games, the, the performance was all over the shop. Like, for example, Doom Eternal here. With all of the settings at the lowest, at 1080p, I had tried to do some benchmarking, but I just really couldn't find an area which was 100% representative of what, you know, the game is actually like to play. So I just decided just do the caveman approach and throw some gameplay on screen. I'm capturing it with shadow play. So shadow play with the, you know, Kepler architecture isn't quite as good as with like, let's say Ampere. So you can just, you know, mentally add a couple of frames um, to the results here. But yeah, bottom line, you know, you go from like an indoor section, which doesn't really have too much going on. You can be almost in the 60s and then you go outside and it can be way lower than 30 FPS. Um, you know, the DLC areas in particular just, oh boy. The bottom line is then, there are games now which simply are not playable on Kepler. If we're talking about features or we're just talking about the performance itself. Sure, Nvidia can optimize the drivers all day long, but if the card just isn't supported by the game, what is Nvidia supposed to do? Make the error message come up faster. Now, I think it's very important here for us to get one thing really clear. When you buy a card such as this, or a processor, or a motherboard, or whatever really, you're not just buying the product because the product's great, but if you don't have a driver and support, it's basically a paperweight. So what you're really doing is, yes, you're buying the product, but you're also helping the company fuel more research and development in the future, but of course also paying their software engineers to continue to optimize the game and drivers for you the best they can. So what are my opinions? Well, honestly, when it comes to a card such as this, I do understand people's frustration of NVIDIA pulling driver support and I'm kind of in a privileged position. I sometimes get sampled by AMD and NVIDIA and so I kind of am more fortunate than a lot of people and I do understand the frustration of if you have one of these cards and AMD of course are starting to pull um, support from some of their older cards as well. You know, it can be a bit frustrating but at the end of the day, if developers are no longer are actually supporting the card itself in newer games and obviously this is going to continue especially now as the next gen consoles are well just becoming normal yeah it, there is that kind of debate i think this card though is still a fascinating gpu um it was actually a really it was a near and dear card to me because this was like the first tie card that i ever owned and i was so damn proud when i bought it and the performance at the time was just, it was incredible. It was such an amazing product. 
and so I was I was really happy and um, yeah so this card definitely has a kind of a place in my heart so games developers of course can still release games on this card and they will still work so if it's a small indie game for example and I do definitely understand people's frustration however I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are um, as a retrospective and a look at this I, I still find it really fun to play around with old GPUs just to see how they do perform in modern day games and you know, I recently took a look at the GTX 1080 and AMD's RX 480, and you know what, to be honest, the 480 still does amazingly. Like, damn, that card is really good at 1080p and 1440p. I still think that that, in terms of value proposition, is probably one of the best cards that has ever been released, at least in the, in the modern memory. Like, the 480 was just, it was a really damn good card. It's still a shame that they never released the 490, but that's, that's a different topic. With that said, um, yeah, late 2013 to October, October 2021, yeah, pretty good life. Let me know your thoughts on this one. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.